three years ago, and I think I was exactly here in a tent facing in this general direction. But luckily, they fixed the display this time. About until about two minutes ago, you may have noticed that this was bright pink because one of the channels wasn't working on the cable that they had. I thought it was in honour of the colour of my shirt, but apparently not. Um, anyway, so this is what I'm going to talk about, and this is what I work on. Um, what I'm going to do is, first of all, tell you what I mean. So this is the foundation that I work for. I'm the chief science officer of this thing. It's a charity. It's registered in the US, but we actually have a, a subsidiary over here now. And we're interested in using regenerative medicine against aging. So first of all, what's regenerative medicine? Well, many of you probably know this. I'm hearing a hell of a lot of feedback still. Are you all right there? All right, let me hold off for a second because they are filming this. And it... All right, so um, yeah, regenerative medicine, as probably most of you know, includes things like stem cell therapies and tissue engineering. Oh, I love it. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, uh, uh, but it also includes a lot of other things that are not normally thought of as regenerative medicine. It includes things that involve, well, anything that involves restoring the microscopic structure of an organ, or of the whole body for that matter, to how it was before it suffered some sort of injury. So when you do stem cell therapy, what you're doing is you're doing regenerative medicine at the cellular level. When you do tissue engineering, you're doing it at the whole organ level. You're putting a whole new heart or a whole new liver or something like that into the body. Um, you can also do regenerative medicine at the molecular level. You can, like, get rid of garbage that's accumulating inside a cell, for example. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about that later. So that's what regenerative medicine means. It's quite a broad term, and it's often used a bit too narrowly. All right, then. The other thing, however, that I wanted to make sure you all understand is what I mean by aging. Because that's actually a much more complicated question than you might think. And a lot of people have a lot of different definitions of what they mean by aging. Now, in particular, from the point of view of the general public, as opposed to a scientific definition, which I'm going to get to later, what this basically means is anything that's more likely to be bad for you when you get older than what happens when you are young. And that's actually a lot broader than most people think. Most people equate this word here, aging, with, or death from aging anyway, they think that means death from natural causes. And so they think, well, hang on, why would you want a foundation to combat that? Because obviously that's the best way to die, the way that you die when you haven't had any of the diseases that we know we don't want to get, like Alzheimer's disease and, you know, cardiovascular disease and so on. And you, you get away with living a reasonable life, you know, reasonably healthy for your age until, let's say, 1995, and then you keel over nice and quickly. A lot of people think that's actually quite a good thing. But I want to emphasize that that's not aging. All of the diseases of old age are diseases of old age for one simple reason, namely that they are aspects of the later stages of aging. So when we combat aging, we are also combating all of the things that you already knew that you didn't want to have, all right? All of the diseases of old age, all of the disabilities, everything that goes on, everything that makes an older person unable to keep up with their granddaughter on the dance floor. All right. So... What that means in terms of numbers is rather, rather shocking, really. Since we've established that death from aging is not just death from natural causes, and it's actually everything that kills older people more often than younger people, we're talking about something in the region of 100,000 people a day dying of it. Out of 150,000 people worldwide that die of all causes added together worldwide, okay, two-thirds of them die of aging. Um, in the West, in, all, in any, any industrialized country, the proportion is this sort of number, 90% of all deaths. So I think it's pretty, uh, pretty unarguable that this is actually humanity's biggest problem. We've got a lot of problems. You know, we've got climate change, we've got malaria, we've got AIDS, we've got all those things. This is bigger than all of those added together. It's really, really rather nasty. Plus also, I mean, what part of this do people not understand? Um, I mean, this is, this is someone who's not suffering the diseases of old age. This is someone who's about to die of natural causes, and she's not really quite as, as happy-looking as these people on the left. So, so all in all, I, I'm inclined to feel that even if it were a case of just death from natural causes, it's something we'd like to fix. Sorry about that. I'll try not to lean forward. Um, all right, so what am I going to talk about for the next, let's say, 40 minutes until I give you time to ask questions? I'm going to talk about all this lot. 
first of all, I'm going to explain scientifically, but for a non-scientist audience, um, what the problem really is and what the alternatives are that exist for trying to solve it. Then I'm going to get on and explain some details about the way that I prefer, the way that I think is going to work. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes, I guess, doing actual hardcore biology, in case there are any biologists in the audience, and talk about one of these seven components of the grand plan in a lot of detail. Then I'm going to get on and talk about the longer term, and I'm going to justify what I use as my title, the concept of defeating aging altogether, which, as you will see, I will not have justified in the earlier parts of the talk. And finally, right at the end, I'm going to just talk a little bit about how everybody in this room can actually make a difference to making this happen. All right, so I'm going to start here. I said that there were a bunch of definitions of aging. OK, so I've already dealt with how difficult that is from a purely lay perspective. From a scientific perspective, it turns out it's just as difficult. There are about as many different definitions of aging as there are people who study the biology of aging. But this is a very useful definition when we are looking for a way to think about how to actually intervene, how to actually do something about aging, whereas most of the other definitions are not useful for that purpose. So this is a definition that I really like, and there are two big things that it en encompasses. The first one is metabolism causes pathology. So what I mean by that is very simple. Metabolism is the word that biologists use to denote all of the enormous, immense network of molecular and cellular and systemic processes that happen in our bodies all the time and keep us alive, keep us going from one day to the next as healthy as we are. That's metabolism. Pathology is the word that I'm going to use to describe everything that goes wrong later in life. All of the diseases of old age, all of the things that we don't necessarily call diseases, but that are nevertheless bad for us, like, you know, decline of function of the immune system, decline of muscle mass, that sort of stuff. All right, so metabolism causes pathology. Aging is a side effect of being alive in the first place for too long. OK, that's all it really is. Now, the other thing I'm saying here, which is the really important thing that I absolutely want, to, want you to make absolutely sure you understand, because I'm going to come back to it a lot in the, next, in the rest of the talk, is I'm using this word damage in this very particular way. I'm defining damage for the purpose of this talk to be the set of intermediates between metabolism and pathology. OK, so what I mean there is damage is the set of molecular and cellular side effects of metabolism that happen all the time, immediate side effects that even start being created before we're born, OK, and that accumulate because, for whatever reason, metabolism does not repair that damage. So these various types of molecular and cellular change accumulate and accumulate throughout life and for a very long time, they are utterly harmless. Metabolism is perfectly happy just ignoring them. But eventually, they accumulate to a level of abundance that metabolism can no longer handle. And metabolism starts to work progressively less and less well. And that's when this thing, the pathologies, start to happen. So there's your definition of aging. Metabolism causes pathology. And it does so by creating these various types of intermediate that I'm calling damage, which accumulate and eventually get in the way. All right. Why is that such a useful definition? This is basically why. It, it allows us to classify, to, to characterize the various ways in which we might go about combating aging. So here's what I just said. Metabolism causes damage, causes pathology. And here are the two traditional approaches for going about combating aging. First one I'm going to call the geriatrics approach. Okay? That is basically the whole of what you know already about combating age-related diseases and age-related ill health. It's all of the medicine that we have today. People go in and they identify the pathologies of old age. Hopefully, they do so before those pathologies have progressed too far. And they try to slow down the progression of those pathologies. They try to actually stop the pathologies from getting to a life-threatening stage as early as they otherwise would. All right, that sounds like a fine thing in principle. And indeed, it is. It's better than nothing. Um, so that's geriatric approach. Now, a lot of people, for a long time, have felt that, well, yes, that's all very well. But in general, in life, prevention is better than cure. Maybe this is another example. Maybe we'll actually be more effective in postponing the pathologies of old age if we try to get stuck in at an earlier stage in the chain of events. If we try to go in here instead, try to actually clean up metabolism and stop it from creating these various types of damage in the first place. Obviously, that would have the same effect. It would postpone the age at which the damage reaches a point that causes pathologies to happen. So again, that sounds like a great idea in principle. 
So, um, why don't we start with these two approaches? Well, unfortunately, it's not looking too good. You certainly don't have to be a biologist to understand the problem with the geriatrics approach. Here is a small subset of the things that go wrong with us during old age. Um, you've heard of all of them. They exacerbate each other. They accelerate. It's basically a losing battle. It's a downward spiral. And fundamentally, that's because we really are, in this case, intervening too late in the chain of events. The damage of aging is accumulating throughout life and continuing to accumulate after the pathologies begin to emerge. So the geriatrician's job is intrinsically getting harder and harder and harder as the patient gets, up, gets older. So that means that, yes, the geri geriatrics approach is better than nothing, absolutely. But it's not much better than nothing. And critically, because of this, because it's intervening too late, it never can, even in principle, it never can be much better than nothing. The geriatrics approach is simply not the way we're going to fix aging in the long run. All right, so that leaves us with the gerontology approach. Unfortunately, there's a problem with that too, which is here. This is a um, simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how metabolism works. And that looks bad enough, doesn't it? But that's nothing. That's nothing. The problem is that this is a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how metabolism works. And if there are any biologists here, I'm quite sure you all agree with me that 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 is absolutely dwarfed. That is absolutely nothing as compared to the astronomical amount that we don't know about how metabolism works. We are just indescribably ignorant still about how biology really functions. We know a hell of a lot more than we did 30 years ago, 50 years ago, but it's a fraction of the actual total, totality of biology. Okay, so there's a, just an incredible amount more to do. If you try to intervene in a system like this about which you understand so, so little, then you just are going to, have to do more harm than good. You are going to have unintended consequences that outweigh the benefits that you may actually achieve. So, ultimately, the gerontology approach is not broken in principle the way the geriatrics approach is, but it is certainly broken for the foreseeable future. There is no way that we are going to make a major impact on aging by trying to clean up this process with anything like the, amount, the tiny amount of knowledge that we have at the moment. All right, so it doesn't look very good, does it? But I wouldn't be here if that were the end of my story. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about why it's not the end of my story. I'm going to start by using a small analogy. Um, now, clearly, the human body is a machine. It's a really, really complicated machine, and we don't have the plans, but it's still a machine. And therefore, there is a fair chance that we may be able to actually get some clues for how to extend the functioning lifespan of the machine, that machine, beyond what you might call its warranty period, by looking at how we already successfully extend the functioning lifespan of simple man-made machines beyond their warranty period. So that's what I'm going to do for a moment. First of all, here's a car that is more than 50 years old. All right? Now, most cars obviously last 10 or 15 years before you junk them and get a new one. This one's lasted a lot longer. Why? Because it was built that way. This car's been built of nice corrosion-resistant metal and really tough tires and all that sort of stuff. And that is basically the same reason why the human body lasts so much longer than the body of a dog or a mouse. We're just built better in the first place. We have more comprehensive, more sophisticated, inbuilt, automatic anti-aging machinery inside us than what those shorter-lived species do. All right, so that is one way to make a machine last unusually long. But the thing I actually want to emphasize on this slide is not the picture. The thing I want to emphasize is the title. I, I put VW Bugs up here for a